Welcome in to the Take the North podcast presented by Odyssey. It is episode 50 of the Take the North podcast. We have reached the month of February. I'm pleased this afternoon to be joined by Herb Howard <laughs> of the Bigs. Herb, how you doing? Man, what's going on, man? I'm good. How you feeling? Excited to have you on. This is a milestone episode for us. Episode 50 of the Take the North I get the Pod. Samurai Mike episode? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> you're going to have to, before we get out of here, you're going to have to sing his verse of the Super Bowl Shuffle just to let the people know what's going on. Uh, for all our audience, download, listen, subscribe. Uh, get this podcast wherever you get your podcasts on the Odyssey app or elsewhere. Don't forget to watch this episode on the 670 The Score YouTube page. There's a lot of content there. Uh, and our Take the North episodes are, are are there in full if you want to see what we're saying and not just hear what we're saying. But but Herb, uh, it, it's February. We 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 made it. We're 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 looking at a Super Bowl matchup between the Chiefs and the Eagles, and the 2022 NFL season is coming to a uh, pretty exciting climax, in my opinion, with two teams that have been good all year. Yeah, no, it's, it's kind of as expected. You expected the Eagles. They were the best team in the league all year. They were the best team in the NFC all year. Their quarterback got hurt down the stretch. They hit some bumps. People start to question whether or not they could actually get there. But they were the best team all year. It was a three-headed race in the AFC to figure out, you know, Chiefs, Bills, Bengals. That kind of sorted itself out. The Chiefs come out on top of that. So I think as expected, it should be a pretty good game come Super Bowl Sunday. So we've got a ton to get into in regards to the quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs and and yeah. what he has meant to that franchise and what he might have potentially could have maybe perhaps meant to the Chicago Bears if things had had sorted out a little differently uh, uh, six years ago. But 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 before we get into all that, I just wanted to to kind of uh, express my excitement for having you on today. David Hall is not uh, on the show today, uh, he'd taken a little bit of a, a breath, and I was excited to have you on because I, I since you've joined the beat. Uh, I've been, um, one, impressed by your acclamation to the beat and then also just energized by the way you go about things. And so I was just uh, hopeful that you could give our audience a little bit, um, I guess, perspective and some background in terms of, of when you joined the beat and kind of how, how, how your journey of being behind the curtain there at Hales Hall has changed maybe some perceptions you have about the, the, the team that you followed for a long time. No, that's for sure, Dan. Again, I, I, I'm Grateful for the opportunity to be on. I've, I've appreciated your work for a very, very long time, way before I got on the beat. Um, I followed your work. I've always appreciated it. It's been an absolute pleasure, you know, getting to know you a little bit up close, getting to learn from you, you know, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, again, thanks for having me on. But for me, I'm I'm a Chicago kid, born and raised, Southside, uh, lifelong Bears fan. Uh, kind of just grew up always following the Bears. I started out, you know, just kind of reporting on my own, doing some, like, freelance type stuff. And then I bumped into – uh, the bigs, we were sharing a, a, a studio space or doing some separate podcasting. We would just talk ball a lot. And during the pandemic season, they were like, hey, why don't we do like a pregame show, like a pregame kickoff show uh, podcast type thing? And we and we did that. And uh, I think we called it a kickoff kickback during that 2020 season. And as that thing kind of took off and that season came and went, it's like, yeah, what would you think about, you know, covering the Bears uh, for the bigs? And I was like, yo, don't you know what I mean? Don't play with me like that. You know what I mean? That's that's I was like, don't even mention to that mention that to me unless, unless that's a real thing. They were like, no, nah, it's a real thing. So they, you know, we didn't talk about it for you know several months, and then they came back and they was like, hey, if you're still serious about that, you know, we can put everything in. And a little bit before training camp of 2021, the Bears sent over all my credentials and everything like that, and uh, it's been it's been going ever since then. And I've just you know I remember coming in that first day and just nervous about how it would go. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where the rooms were. I didn't know where to sit. I didn't know, you know, how the day would go. And I, I I wasn't so much, you know, nervous about being around the Bears. I'm not that kind of person to be like, oh, you know, football players. I was more nervous to be around y'all, Dan, to be honest with you. I'm like walking in the room and it's like, yo, there's Dan Witterer and, and, you know, there's Hub Arkish and like there's Brad Biggs. I was like, yo, that's kind of crazy. Um, but uh, and then you watch I mean, us and you realize we're all just a bunch of slappies <laughs> and that there, there's nothing, nothing to be in awe of at all. <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of it's kind of like those feelings you get before the game. It's like once the ball goes up, that kind of all goes away. So Matt, I think Matt Nagy walked in there, ended up asking him the first question. Then since then, I haven't really felt those kind of nerves anymore. It's just been, you know, coming to work, you know, doing my job, trying to get the information that I need, the information I think that 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 the fans will want and just trying to be authentic and it's been good i've been like like i said i've been able to establish some good connections inside that room and you know inside that building it's been fun i've got still got a lot of lot to learn uh but i'm enjoying the process and, and looking forward to continuing it 
refresh my memory. Did you do anything during the 2020 season? Were, were, were you part of the, the group then? And we had a weird couple of years where there was, where access yeah. was so, so strange that I forget who was where because we were all working from home and sitting on Zooms all the time. Yeah, no, not other than that pregame show. We had uh, Joe Lewis was covering yeah. the Bears for the Bigs at the time. And shout out to Flo's. He, uh, when I came on, uh, he was still with the Bigs. He's since moved on. But uh, he he kind of got me acclimated, showed me kind of what it would be like, where how I got to the press box in, in <laughs> at Soldier Field. You know, I had been up there for like the suites and stuff, but I didn't know specifically where the press box was. So uh, shout out to Joe Lewis for doing that. But uh, yeah, no, he he was on in 2020, and uh, since then I've been kind of just handling it. And I appreciate the Bigs for the opportunity. They kind of let me do it. You know how I how I feel comfortable doing it uh, yeah. within the parameters that they've set up, and it, it's been really really good. I've I've enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I try to be myself on a daily basis. And so far, uh, I think it's going well. Well, I just want to let our audience know, you, you know, like there are people that are on a stair climb in this business. And there are people on an escalator. I think you're out, you're one of these people, especially in our market, that's on an escalator because mm. of your confidence, because of your, your comfort level in there. And one of the things that I, I've appreciated that you bring to the room is it's that ability to uh, be fearless with the questions you ask, to, to ask very direct uh, you know, sharp questions without being combative. Uh, you know, right. they're, they're inquisitive they're, it, it, and, it, and it draws information out. And so when you sit in a room, I know you felt it when, when, when somebody else will ask a question somewhere in the room and you're like, man, that's, we got some stuff out of that, you know, yeah. and then you try to study, you know, what, what was it about the way that question was asked that got that out of that person up at the dais? And so I've appreciated your, your ability to come in there and, and, and contribute in that way where it, where it unearths stuff that, that helps everybody. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, man. Like I said, I've, I've learned from all of you guys in that room, just little things from here, little things from there. But for me, it's just about, you know, like I said, just being authentic, being honest. I, I love football. I've loved it for a long time. I, I know it reasonably well. And so I know what I want to get out of a particular interaction with the player or a coach. I try to be very, very respectful. Anybody that's in the NFL as a player or a coach, extremely, extremely good at their job. I know we it's our job to critique them. And sometimes as fans, we can, you know, even talk about them and get down on them. This guy sucks. Nobody in the NFL sucks, right? They're all really, really, really good football players. There's levels to it for sure. And the Bears got to get to that next level if they want to win in terms of the players there. But I always try to be respectful. Um, I want to be disarming, but there's things I got to know. So I'm just going to ask you, uh, and, and not in any demeaning way, not in any degrading way. I'm just going to ask you, and hopefully uh, you'll give me a, as honest an answer as you can. And so, so far, uh, I've been able to get some 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 good answers. Sometimes they're like, no, I'm not going there, but <laughs> it, that's just the nature of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've all been there. So uh, I, we'll get into more of this later in the show, but I know you share my energy and my excitement for 2023 and just the, the fascination of covering this organization and this team at a landmark time. We obviously get the hiring of Kevin Warren uh, last month in, in uh, you know, a move that really sets direction for the franchise going forward on two different tracks. You've got th this surplus of salary cap space. You got the number one overall draft pick. You got a promising young quarterback. Like one way or the other, we are going to look back at 2023 and go, damn, like that was really, really compelling stuff to cover. Yeah, one way or the other, this season is huge. This offseason, these next few months, is going to be huge for this organization going forward for the next five, maybe 10 or more years, right? They have to hit this offseason. Ryan Post talked about, you know, his, his appreciation for the fans and understanding where this Bears team was last offseason, not having these huge expectations for who he could go out and get and what splash moves he can make. That's not the case this year. Everybody yeah. is expecting a home run. Everybody was fine with the single or double last offseason. This season, you got to hit that thing out the park. You've got everything you need. You've got your full lineman of draft picks. You got the number one pick, which should allow you to get some more picks. You got all this cap space. Everybody, the expectations are huge. The pressure is on. They've got to hit this thing. And if they don't, they're going to set themselves back at least five years. If they hit it, they could, <laughs> they could, they could expedite their Super Bowl window really, really fast. It's a perfect segue, and I'm going to correct you on one thing because there were a lot of people that were okay with the dribbler back to the mound this past year. They let, they, they, they let that little two bouncer back to the pitcher that was an easy flip to first for an out pass and said, oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get another at bat at this, and it doesn't really matter. But the segue here is just the, the, the emphasis on how much this offseason means. And it goes back to what we talked about a few minutes ago with that name, Patrick Mahomes. And it takes you back to a 2017 draft process that I think we can explore a little bit in our conversation today, forward looking rather than through the lens that we've looked at it for so long, which is backward looking with the lament of, oh my God, the Bears really stepped in it there. And they, they, they said, but look, like the conclusion is undeniable. They set themselves back 
You know, Justin no, no. Fields is here because Mr. Trubisky failed. Matt Eberflus is here because Matt Nagy failed. You know, <laughs> Ryan Poles is here because Ryan Pace failed. No, no. And so what you have to do is learn lessons from – all these lessons that you've, you, you've had to learn from, but particularly that 2017 draft that tells you things because Ryan Poles was in the building in Kansas City when the Chiefs woke up on the first round of the draft with the 27th overall pick and somehow finished the night with their forever quarterback. And, right. and, and, and the Bears, we know what happened inside Hallis Hall and the number of missteps that were made during the process. Um, but I guess starting out, because this is going to be a meaty discussion about Patrick Mahomes, it, it, as you watch him go onto that Super Bowl stage for the third time, in 37 months, what are the things about Patrick Mahomes that to you are, are, are defining? I think you start with, with what we knew coming out of college. It's those tangible things. You knew he had the arm strength. You knew he had the arm talent to make any throw on the field. You knew he had this kind of generational arm talent and this kind of uncanny ability to make these throws from different arm angles and things like that. What we did know was the intangible things that we learned about him in terms of his leadership ability, uh, the impact that he would have on his teammates, how tough he is. We didn't know we didn't know those things about him. Honestly, I was leaning heavily toward Deshaun Jackson coming out. I mean, Desha Deshaun yeah. Watson, I'm sorry, coming out of the draft, even more so than Patrick Mahomes. But either way, um, I think that we've learned that that Patrick Mahomes not only has the physical tools, but he has those intangible things that can make you a true leader of a franchise, not just the face of a franchise, not just their best player, but a true, true leader in that locker room. I think all those guys follow him. I think the Cincinnati Bengals and their mayor learned that about Patrick <laughs> Mahomes last week, right? You talk all that stuff and these guys came to bat for, for Patrick Mahomes. You go on the, you got the mayor talking about Joe Burrow might be his father. And it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. All right. We we got we all gonna wrap for our brother. So I, I I love what I've seen from Patrick Mahomes, not only physically but the intangibles. What I think is Austin underestimated with Patrick Mahomes is just what you talked about, and it's the, it's that competitive passion and that competitive mm -hmm. fire. Because Patrick is like this gregarious dude who's got the funny, you know, Kermit the Frog voice that he says, and yeah, so, the so weird you, voice he walks funny, <laughs> so, 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 right? Like so, you don't think of him in the same light. Like I always say that in my lifetime, there are four athletes that to me are competitive psychopaths that like no one could imagine it's Jordan it's Kobe it's Tiger Woods and it's Tom Brady right and yeah. it's those guys that 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 are are so obsessive about one thing and it's the end result of whatever competition they're in that they will do anything to get that and I think there is a, an element of that to Patrick that just hasn't really been appreciated to the level that it needs to be appreciated at. Listen, he's still in his 20s. He's going back to the Super Bowl for the third time. There's an opportunity here that if he wants to play another 10, 12 years, he can start to load those fingers up with rings. He can start to load up those trophy cases in Kansas City with, with AFC championship trophies. And then we'll look back on this and go, Oh, of course. Of course the dude had a high ankle sprain and went out there and, and in an AFC championship game had enough to will his team to a win, including a five-yard scramble that sets up the winning field goal on a bum ankle yeah. that tells you everything about that wiring, right? That competitive fire and, and, that, and that, you know, competitive psychopath DNA that's in some of these guys. Yeah, I think a lot of that is hindsight. You don't really know those things as you're experiencing them. You go back to Tom Brady's first Super Bowl with the Patriots. You just thought, hey, this this young kid, you know, caught lightning in a bottle. You don't understand the maniacal work that goes into that and how prepared he was for that moment when Mo Lewis knocked Drew Bledsoe into another dimension. Like he was he was prepared for that moment. And so uh, you don't understand that until later, until he wins, you know, third, fourth Super Bowl. And you're like, man, this dude kind of, he's just wired different. So I think we're going to look back on this thing and say, man, the high ankle sprains, it's one of the worst things you can do in, in, without having torn or broken something. Like that thing could take easily four or five weeks. And so for him to come back a week later and be ready to go and then to meet the pressure of Burrow Head and all that type of stuff, uh, to still make plays for his team, to still scramble and do those improvisational things. We saw him with the little flip touchdown pass over on the sideline. Like he's that kind of guy. And I think only years from now we're going to look back and appreciate all the things that we're seeing in the moment. And look, I mean, he goes back to a year ago. And obviously, they didn't make the Super Bowl, and they just had to get in the AFC Championship game. But just the, those plays he made in the shootout against Josh yeah. Allen in the Bills game, where you say that. I'm going to read you some numbers here because I was compiling some of these on Mahomes that just they're, they're, they're absolutely mind blowing. And we're five years into this, okay? And so he's got 24,241 regular season career passing yards, which would be the Bears' all time record if he stopped playing today. It would be the Bears' all time record. Stop playing today. <laughs> It would Jeez. be the Bears' all-time record. He has 192 regular season touchdown passes. Would also be the Bears' record if he stopped playing today. His career regular season record as a starter is 64 and 16. 
His playoff record is 10 and three. He has played zero road playoff games. Okay. Wow. So wow. he's not, not only never missed the playoffs, he's never missed conference championship Sunday. And he has never been trailing at the end of comp- at regulation in conference championship Sunday. His two losses are overtime, overtime losses, one against Brady, where he never got to touch the ball because they lost the coin flip. And right. the other one, obviously to Burrow and, and the Bengals last five seasons, the five years that he's been starting, he's his average season has been 4,791 yards and 38 touchdowns. Average season over five years. First five years as a starter in the league. That's sick, man. That's absolutely <laughs> sick. Like, you know what I mean? To not have to go on the road. They hosted five AFC title games. Like, that's that's like crazy stuff, man. It's like just, That's absolutely absurd. You're talking about averaging 4,000 yards. If we can get a 4,000 000- yard passing season in Chicago we go crazy he wakes up out of bed doing that that's that's the baseline and it, it's, it's it's absolutely crazy to think just how good he is and I know you got to account for how much the league has changed and how much of a passing league it's become and how many of the rules have kind of lent themselves towards more offensive production but that being said there's 31 other guys doing that they playing that position they aren't doing it like he's doing it though right and so that dude is absolutely different uh he's going to be on that Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks when it's all said. Some people already put him there. Some people are already talking about him as an all-time great, and I don't, I'm don't. i not going to argue with them, but certainly once he's done, like you said, they continue on the trajectory that they're on, and he finds himself in four, five, six more Super Bowls. Uh, he's going to be undoubtedly cemented in that Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks all-time. We're recording this episode on February 1st, which is, you know, it is annual Tom Brady retirement day. Second straight year on February right. 1st that Tom Brady's announces retirement. But I remember that first AFC championship game that Mahomes was in against Brady and you watched it and it was compelling to watch this young dude go toe to toe with the goat and be like, I'm not, I'm not scared of this. This moment isn't too big for me. This stage excites me. And that's what Mahomes has been. And he's continued that on. And so like th- th- there's two parts to this, her, because I think you'd agree that that Ryan Poles has been very consistent in talking about his pursuit of achievement being pursuing achievement that can be sustained, right? That you mm-hmm. can that you, you don't just have this flash year that the Bears always have, and then you fall off, and right. you know you make some decisions, and you can't you can't have any longevity of the success you have. And so Ryan experienced it in Kansas City. He he got there in the first four years. He's under Scott Pioli, and uh, you know Todd Haley's the coach, and then Romeo Cornell has to relieve him at some point. It was just a mess. And then Ryan Poles watches the Chiefs become what they've become. And people will always say, well, yeah, of course they became what they became. They, they, they landed on a generational quarterback in Patrick Mahomes that became the engine for what has been these last five years. And my pushback to that is always Give the Chiefs credit for that. It's not like they somebody pulled their name out of the Patrick Mahomes raffle right. in 2017 right. and said, he's coming to your city. They discovered him, right? Like, And obviously, he was going to be a first-round draft pick somewhere. But they woke up with the number 27 overall pick and they had did so much homework throughout the process to believe that they had uh, not only a generational talent, but an infrastructure and a support system that could bring out the best in him, that they deserve credit for having Patrick Mahomes you know, the guy that's driven this. And as we talk about the bears, they've been in this, this spinning your wheels mode because they missed on Mitch Trubisky. So I, I, as you look back on, on 2017, what are the things that, 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 that stick in your head about the woulda, shoulda, coulda, what might've been and, and and where this whole thing wound up? Man, to your point with the chiefs though, it's, you got to give them credit for the work they did before the draft to understand one. We love this kid. Two, where is he going to be in the draft? Can we possibly get ourselves in position to be able to get him? There's a lot of work that goes into that. And then to be able to execute on the day of to actually go get him. Now you got him in the building. That's just step one. And we talked about how great he is. But football is the ultimate team sport. Ain't you not good enough to do this by yourself. I don't care who you are. They put a really, really good team around him year after year after year no matter what kind of turnover they had they had the huge Tyreek Hill thing and all Tyreek's gone he's taking all the money in Miami what do they do go and be the number one offense again without him and so they continue to just put things around him Andy Reid continues to be the offensive genius that we've known him to be uh and so it's it's the it's everything it's everything in the building that hopefully you know uh Ryan Poe says has some of that in him and he's brought it to Chicago and so we'll see but you go back to 2017 with the Bears and I just then I don't I don't know what they were doing. I don't know <laughs> what they saw in in Mitch Trubisky and his 13 starts in North Carolina. I just I don't understand it. Um, I don't know what what because it's not like they were saying, OK, we, we we've got the number three pick. 
We'll sit here and whichever one of those guys is here, we'll take them. And that right. guy happened to be Mitch Trubisky. You decided that you had to have Mitch Trubisky. He was yep. head and shoulders better than Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes. You had to have him. And he was worth leveraging the franchise for and sending all these picks to the 49ers for. And that's just – it makes no sense. Nobody who was watching college football said, even if you love Mr. Biscay, even if you went through all of the pre-draft process and said, hey, this kid's got it, nobody thought he was – head and shoulders above Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes to where you just could not live with yourself if you didn't go get Mr. Biscay. So Herb, that's a point that I've been making for years now. And I think it's just, it's such a, a valid point to hammer home and hammer home and hammer home again, because as we look forward, the lesson within that, and listen, I think the 2017 draft process has three dozen lessons that can be learned, that can be applied to future drafts. And one of them is don't become infatuated with a guy that you become so blinded to your other options because Ryan Pace was so dedicated to making sure that he he wound up with Mitch Trubisky that he played this game of secrecy throughout the mm -hmm. pre-draft process and then even after all these months and months and months of secrecy which ultimately hurt your process because you weren't involving the right people to the level that they needed to be involved to to truly break down a decision that was going to shape your franchise for at least five years maybe 15, you still got to draft night and felt so jittery that you traded up from three to number two. And you traded up from number three to number two for the very reason that you just stated, because it was it was like, we can't bear the thought of settling for Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes. And in retrospect, you go, wait, what? Wait, what? You, you, you would have lost your mind if the San Francisco 49ers would have pulled the trigger on Mitch Trubisky at number two, and you would have had to settle. I got to stop you there, Dan. That's, that's not even retrospect. Like that's that's not even retrospect. That's not even like having seen what the three trajectories of their of those guys' careers have been, right? And who knows? Mitch Trubisky may find it. He may have himself a really really stellar career going forward. Yep. Whatever. We'll see what happens with Deshaun Watson. We know what Patrick Mahomes is, but that wasn't. That's not hindsight. We you watching them play college football. You knew that the kid who had lit up Alabama twice, who had been the back to back national championship games, you knew that he was better than the quarterback in his same conference in the ACC down the road in North Carolina, you that's that's not something we found out after they got to the league. You knew that before. But again, if you evaluated him, Mr. Trubisky, I'm talking about, and you loved him, no problem. If you just want if you wanted him more, cool. But to say that you had to have him because he was so much better than those two guys. Ridiculous. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that's part of this. As you go forward, you have to understand that, especially in a year like this, where the Bears have the number one overall pick and they've got a bunch of draft picks to use it. You have to understand that every one of those decisions could be one of those pivot points for your franchise, right? One of those points that either puts you on a springboard or throws you into quicksand. And, and you want to make sure you're, you're aiming for the springboard, right? Like, I, Please I know hit the you, springboard. Yeah, just hit the <laughs> springboard and see where it goes. And so, like, like that that's a, a huge lesson in that. Rich Campbell and I had to, to – to, do the deep, deep dive on the quarterback process of 2017 at the end of the 2019 season when the Bears had sort of missed that big window of opportunity in their 100th season to go chase a Super Bowl. And meanwhile, the two quarterbacks that we've mentioned, Mahomes and Watson, were playing for an AFC title that year. And there were a lot of things that we unearthed in our reporting during that process. Some of the intel I don't know we've ever really shared, but th th there's a couple things that, that I want to bring up here because it'll transition us into another part of this conversation it's that the bears actually did like patrick mahomes that they, mm -hmm. they you know they they went to chapel hill and they 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 did this visit with mitch and and immediately from there they flew to lubbock and they they did a private workout and it, it's dave ragone and it's dowell loggins and it's john fox and it's uh ryan pace and and josh lucas and they go down there and they love the kid's swagger they love his arm talent they see him making some of these creative artistry throws that he does and they say like this dude belongs in our top cloud. And, and the, here's some of the names that were in that top cloud going into the 2017 draft for them. Miles Garrett, Mitch Trubisky, Patrick Mahomes, Jamal Adams, Leonard Fournette, Christian McCaffrey. You talked to a lot of people that were involved in the process, and it was Foxy either wanted to pick Jamal Adams or if they were going to take a quarterback, he wanted Deshaun Watson. Dave Ragone wanted Deshaun Watson. Dowell Loggins actually was – banging the table for Christian McCaffrey and wanted Christian McCaffrey to be the, the difference-making superstar in that building. And then you had Ryan Pace and Josh Lucas and then a bunch of scouts who, who really felt strongly that Mitch was the top guy. That's all fine. And and, and Mahomes is in, uh, in that top cloud, right? And, and so it goes to the, the point of like, okay, if he's in your top cloud, why can't you wait for him at three? You know, why, why did Mitch sell you so much? And so 
uh, you know, there's two parts of this. Number one is, is if you have a, a, a healthy organization and a healthy mm-hmm. infrastructure, your team president comes along at some point in those three months and says, Hey, um, I realize we don't usually get to pick in the top five very often. What are you guys thinking about with this pick? Right. Get a little right. bit of intel. And then says, Hey, uh, Ryan, have you told John? Uh, that, that, that you know that, that you're drafted a quarterback. That you're, you know, there, there's so many points within that thing where, again, if you're a healthy organization, and I bring that up because Kevin Warren is here, and I think he will provide more health in this regard to the sounding board, the discussion, the brainstorming. Have you considered? Have you thought about? Do I have a connection in one of these players' backgrounds that I can call and ask and say, does this guy have the it factor? Does he have the DNA? It's really interesting because, it, you know, like we can kill them for the lack of um, homework that they did on Deshaun Watson. And, and justifiably sure. so, they deserve to be killed. But they liked Patrick Mahomes and then ultimately got to draft day and decided they couldn't wait around couldn't live with them. and see. No. Now, to your point earlier, that, that you got to learn that lesson. And so this regime has to understand that. And I think they will. I think they'll, they'll be better. But they got to understand that we cannot – miss this thing and we can't be so stuck on this one person or this one player then you just listed five or six guys i'd love to have any of them except mr Trubisky, right just give give me any of those other guys any of them even Leonard for even Leonard for give me any of those other guys i'd be fine with it um they missed it and it's like you could have just sat where you were and if for whatever reason somebody else was thinking like you were thinking and took mitch one or two you're still gonna get yourself a really really good player right where you are and to 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 not see it that way, to not view it that way was a huge, huge oversight. And like you said, it, it's it set this franchise back at least five years. And so, cool. Now you've been bad more. Now you've got Justin Fields. Now you've got a new head coach and you've got a new GM and a new president. Can they do it better? Because you don't like you don't want to be in the top five over and over and over again in terms of draft position. Before we get into the Kansas City portion of this discussion, which obviously is the lessons that Ryan Poles learned in the organization that found Patrick Mahomes or or at least found him to be theirs, right? Mm -hmm. I want to ask you this because this is a conversation that comes up in Chicago and there's there's, there's two parts of it. The The newfangled part of the conversation is would the Bears have been in a Super Bowl any time in the last six seasons if they had t- taken Patrick Mahomes. The other part of this is back in like 2019, early 2020, when people would get angry when you brought up the 2017 quarterback draft, they'd say, you know, the, the pushback would be, well, if Mahomes was here, he wouldn't have been any good anyway. And I would always counter that, her by saying, if you think that the organization you follow and root for is capable of screwing up one of the best football players at the most of important all position of all time, <laughs> then what's the point of even following anymore, right? If you think they're that inept that they would get a guy with that level of talent and potential and screw him up, then what's the point of following anymore? If they can't even take the, the, a gift like that and turn him into something, then they're so lost. And so I, I, I guess I, I'll get you to respond to that and then see if you think that they would have found their way to a Super Bowl if they would have taken Mahomes instead of Trubisky in 2017. Yeah, I'm with you, man. If you think if you think they're gonna mess up Patrick Mahomes, then you can just throw Justin Fields away. Like this, it doesn't. Like, what are they gonna do with anybody? Right? If you, if you can't get it right with him, and so I think that um, certainly they could have had the opportunity to go to the Super Bowl. I mean, that was a really, really good team that they had in 18. That team was really, really good. It was obviously led by their defense, but if that defense has a complementary offense that can consistently put points on the board, um, what what was the final score? Was it 16, 15? What was the final score in the Eagles game? The playoff? Yeah, game? yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think Patrick Mahomes gets you 17 points. That's what I think. You know, I think I think Patrick Mahomes gets you 17 points. And so I think that with that defense and then he keeps the window open for a little bit longer. And so nobody's nobody's in a hurry to say, hey, no Akeem Hicks, no Khalil Mack. You know, you're not in a hurry to do those things. You're trying to figure out how we can get more pieces in here as opposed to getting rid of some of these guys. And so I think that with Patrick Mahomes and that defense that they had early, uh, early in, in their careers, they would have had an opportunity to go to the Super Bowl for sure. You know, I talked in November, like what, what would the 2018 Bears have been like with 2022 Justin Fields, right? Second year Justin Fields playing with that defense. Now, level that up and say, what would the 2018 Bears have been like with Patrick Mahomes as their quarterback? You know, and you, and you think about it, look, like you can't assume that the developmental process would have been 
exactly the same. You know, no, you had Andy, you had Andy Reid. Andy Reid's right. different. You had an infrastructure of playmakers in there. They understood that they could tap into Patrick's strengths in ways that, that the Bears probably weren't equipped to do it. But Patrick Mahomes is clearly a transcendent talent and would have done things to elevate even the coaches around him and the talent yeah. around him and, and, and done things to, you know, like you say, you get in a playoff uh, uh, scenario in 2018, and now all you need to do is get to 20 to move on yeah. to the next round and then take your crack. You know, that Fangio the defense was ridiculous. That Fangio defense was absolutely ridiculous. And so you get that defense with a quarterback that can put you some points on the board, who's going to elevate everybody in the building, not just on Sundays, but everybody in the building all week long, all season long. He does that. I think he absolutely would have made a difference and they would have certainly had a chance to go to the Super Bowl with that defense and Patrick Mahomes. So because of, of everything we've just said, I think I think you could 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 make the argument that the most egregious part of the 2017 draft process was trading up from three to two and and, and just giving away other capital because you decided that, that that guy you couldn't live without. So in Kansas City, there's a situation here. And I had a chance last spring at the owners meetings in, in Florida to talk to Ryan Poles about being part of the Patrick Mahomes draft process and the things that he took away from that. And the lesson isn't a new one, but it's one that's worth reemphasizing as the Bears go into this next draft cycle because he said, look, like you can talk yourself into players' flaws over and over and over again to the point where you get scared and you get scared mm -hmm. off by it. And his, his point was with Patrick, the discussions just continually went back to what can he do and what are his skills and his talents? What can he do that's different than anyone else? And they decided to focus on those. It wasn't like, we're not going to ignore the flaws. We're going to acknowledge that a lot of his playmaking in college at Texas tech was off script and sure. was, you know, a little bit reckless at times. And there's, there's some throws that you go, Oh God, don't throw that. You throw that in the NFL. Let's pick every single time. But then they said, all right, let's not be, be freaked out by that. And let's zero in on what he really can do. And then they saw all these things. And there was a, a, a film session that Ryan brought up that he said that is, when it really clicked and I think it's Andy Reid and it's Veach and it's John Dorsey uh, you would assume that that Matt Nagy and maybe Brad Childress are in there and they eliminated all of the the check down throws throws behind the line of scrimmage and basically went for for throws with air yards of 15 yards or more and they just sat there didn't say a word and just watched this this video run and they saw accuracy and they saw arm talent and they saw fearlessness and they saw an, uh, like all right like this dude's got stuff. Got Andy Reid and, and John Dorsey had spent time with Brett Favre and they're like, all right, like sometimes you live with the disaster because you know, there's going to be some majestic brilliance yeah. that's somewhere in there. And so I think as they go forward, that's a good thing for Ryan Poles to say to everybody in that room that's out there scouting players, talking to them at the senior bowl, talking to them at the combine, like don't get fixated on their flaws. Tell me what they can do. And let's, let's, let's have a, a detailed discussion about that. Yeah, that's got to be the huge part of it. Certainly, you want to know what their flaws are. Are they correctable things? Can we get them in our building and work on those things? But what do they do well? And can we kind of use the things that they do well to put them in the best position to succeed? That's what good coaches do. That's what good organizations do. What do you do well? Let me put you in a position to do that. I don't have to make Lamar Jackson Peyton Manning. That's foolish. Let Lamar Jackson be Lamar Jackson. What does he do well? Okay, let's do that. And I think that they uh, in Kansas City were able to identify those things with Patrick Mahomes and say, hey, these are things we can absolutely build upon. I hope they do the same thing with Justin Fields. There's a lot of things to look at and say, he doesn't do this very well yet, but he's shown me everything that I would want from a franchise quarterback at times. He needs to be certainly more consistent. He needs to continue to improve. No doubt about it. But there's not anything that I would say, I want my franchise quarterback to be able to do this that I haven't seen him do, at least in some flashes. Again, the consistency hasn't been close, but he can do those things. So if you can focus on those things and say, hey, can he make all the throws? Yes. Is he able to read these defenses and get it out on time? Yes. Not nearly enough, but he can do it. And so I think that's the lesson that you got to go with all these players as you continue to evaluate them. What do they do well? Can we get them in our building and work on the things that they need to improve? But don't be so bogged down by them that you miss a generational Hall of Fame, all time great quarterback. No doubt. And I want to get back to Justin with you in a second. But like, so the other part of this lesson for that, that Ryan brought up was just the ability to create a developmental infrastructure. And it doesn't apply to the Bears and the quarterback situation right now, but it will apply to whoever their their top draft pick in this class is. Right. Like, how do we facilitate development in a way that that produces long term results? Because no matter who the Bears take, whether it's at one, six, 10, 14, whoever that is, that person has to become 
a six, seven year starter for them to accelerate this, this, this relevance process. No doubt about it. They need a perennial pro bowl player for a decade. Like this can't be a decent player. This has to be home run. This guy's got to be some type of hall of fame trajectory. And I know that's maybe too much pressure, but this guy has to be an absolute difference maker, not just a guy, not a good piece. He has to be an absolute difference maker for you, wherever he is, offensive lineman, wide receiver, defensive line, whatever you're going to do, this guy has to be that type of a player. So one of the things Ryan Pohl said is, is in Kansas City, you've got not only Andy Reid overseeing Patrick Mahomes as a rookie, but you got Matt Nagy and Mike Kafka, and they were able to um, allow Patrick, obviously, the on-ramp with Alex Smith as the starter to, to make only one start late in the year just to, to get some, some experience, but at the same time, to not allow him to feel too patient that there was an urgency they were they were they were needling his urgency and his hunger every single day of the developmental process trying to bring that out of him to understand like this league doesn't wait around for you when it's your time it's your time and you better be ready to go and so i was really appreciative of, of hearing that from ryan's experience that, that 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 is a part of this puzzle is is figuring that out and 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 having people that you trust on your staff to push buttons because a lot of this sport as much as we talk about talent is understanding who are the guys that push the buttons you mm -hmm. know who can motivate and who can inspire mm -hmm. and who can bring out the best in you how do you lean on these guys to get them to understand that sense of urgency it's right now it's not it's not yeah, later. always like we, we we brought you in here to be the franchise right now we're not talking about later and i think that you know the the People just tend to do that. And we saw, hey, we gotta we gotta wait. We, we've got Nick Foles and we've got Andy Dalton and we're gonna wait, we're gonna make this kid wait. Wait for what? That you brought him in here for this, right? Get him ready. And if you don't start him, that's fine. But you didn't even get him ready. And so you, you gotta understand that. And so shout out to the Chiefs for understanding that immediately to start to push his buttons and say, Hey, no, we brought you in here to be an all-time great quarterback. Let's get that thing started right now. Why delay the development of your, you know, pupil for what reason? Nobody does that. Nobody. I talk about this all the time in, in humans, and I'm going a little bit off here, Dan. I, I apologize, but I talk about this all the time in humans. Humans are the only species on the planet that <laughs> intentionally, intentionally delay the development of our offspring. Every other species on this planet, the moment their offspring is born, they immediately start to prepare them for the environment that they've inherited. Humans are like, no, no, we're going to wait until you're 18 before I tell you about this. We got to wait till you're 16 and tell you about that. The environment is what it is. Get them ready. If you draft them to be your franchise, get them ready from day one. I'm going to get you with my son and you can give him some of these life lessons that I, <laughs> that I haven't been able to push on him yet. And you can push him a little more clearly and get him get him ready for the world that, that he's walking into sports and otherwise. Um, so so like to your point there, though, like this, this circles us naturally into Justin because I took some blowback in November um, when the Bears were having offensive success but not finishing. Right, and there's that three game stretch where they've got opportunities against the the Dolphins, the Lions, and the Falcons to finish a game and and to put some punctuation on what was a really promising stretch of offense. Obviously, a really promising stretch from the quarterback. And and, and my my argument to that is just like, look, like this isn't going to wait around for you. Yes, Justin can eventually clear that hurdle. You know, maybe it is in 2023. Maybe it is, you know, in October of this upcoming season where he puts together a stretch of uh, a month where he, he closes out games in different ways, seals a, a victory because they, they're leading and he just is able to, to close it out, mm -hmm. comes from behind, leads that rally that we want to see, that game-winning drive that hasn't been part of his resume on, and by the way, a 5-20 and 20 record as, a, as an NFL starter at this point. Let's go. Let's get it going now. I believe he's got it in him. I believe he's got all the capability of doing it, particularly if they upgrade the, the supporting cast on the outside, in front of him, all mm -hmm. the way around with the system. But let's get it going now. And so I'd just be curious to know kind of like with with the obvious optimism that's percolating through the city about who Justin is, what what excites you the most? And what are the, the like top lines of the address this now, points of emphasis now for you as Justin Fields goes into 2023? Yeah, what excites me is the the physical tools that he has, I've, the, the the arm talent that he's has that he has. He he's made all the throws. He can make the deep ball with touch, with accuracy, right? He can throw the deep out from the opposite hash. He can do those types of things. And so I love his his arm talent. He's got the improvisational skills. He's got that elite athleticism. We know about the speed and the legs and all those types of things. So the physical tools are there, but then also the intangibles. I think he really wants to be great. I think he really puts the time in to work at it 
His teammates love him. They all swear by him. They all go to bat for him. I think that those types of things are are as uh, encouraging as the physical things. Now, he's got a lot to work on, right? And so, and he got stunted a little bit last year because they didn't get him ready. He didn't get a lot of reps in the in training camp. And then you just throw him out there against the the, the Cleveland Browns. Matt Nagy should still be locked up for <laughs> attempted murder for what he did to that kid. Like that's that was crazy what he did to him in Cleveland. Um and so th- those types of things have have kind of stunted his growth a little bit, but that's on him now. He's got to start to accelerate those things. He's got to be start to overcome some of those things. But until you get him around a solid offensive line with some real weapons, you're going to continue to see some of those flaws that he has in this game. Some of those things where when he does have a, a solid pocket around him, he doesn't take advantage of it because he's not used to it. He's, he's not expecting to have three, four, five seconds back there in the pocket. So he's surprised when it happens. He's not expecting to have receivers running wide open on corner routes. So he's surprised when it happens. He's not ready to pull the trigger when that happens. And so uh, when you get those things around him, I think he'll be much better. He's got a lot of work to do in terms of getting to the point where he can quickly decipher what happens to him post-snap. I think he certainly got to the point where he understands pre-snap. Number one, what he wants to do and what the defense is showing pre-snap. What happens to him post snap and how quickly he can decipher that and find the answers is the next step in his development. The key word in what you just said is how quickly, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and that's the thing because, like, you talk to people all around the league and there's zero questions about Justin's aptitude, his ability to take in information, ability to understand the information he's taken in. Luke Getze praises that on a weekly basis in terms mm-hmm. of how much they can give Justin and the volume that he can spit back after, even, even when he makes mistakes, he can come to the sideline and tell you why he made that mistake and what was going on. And so it's not aptitude, it's just how quickly the aptitude can be applied to a league that's full of ferocious animals trying to tear your head off and the guy that you're trying to throw to head off and and like figure it out and figure it out quickly otherwise you just start to get in that wishy-washy uh middle ground that's a danger zone for, for developing quarterbacks no, it's, it's a real real danger zone for developing quarterbacks and i think he starts to get into that space where again that that, that cumulative effect of of not having those consistent pockets not having those consistent wide receivers that are open you got to think he's at ohio state right right, right. every right. offensive lineman they got is better than all your defensive linemen most of the games they play olave and those guys are wide open as soon as the ball snapped and so i'm not even <laughs> having what what's my second read who cares my first guy's wide open right and if i got to get to my second read i've got seven seconds to do so because all these guys are first round linemen and so it's a it's a different thing when you get to the bears it's like yeah none of you guys are 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 open (laughs) like my receivers were at ohio state none of you guys are blocking up front like they were at ohio state and so a little bit of a process um i do think he has the 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 talent to be able to overcome it but i'm excited to see what he can do with that full compliment i think jalen hurts went through the same thing in philly a couple years ago, we we're talking about him. He can't throw. He's inaccurate. His throwing motion is too elongated. His release is too slow. All those types of things. And that's fine. But it immediately changes when he gets an A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith. He's got that all-world offensive line around him. Now he's a legitimate MVP candidate. And so I think you could see a similar turnaround because I think that Justin Fields actually has more natural ability than Jalen Hurts does. I think he's a better – thrower he's got more arm talent he think he's he's, he's a more dynamic runner for sure so i think he's got more natural gifts than jalen hurts i think if you can surround him with some of the things that jalen hurts now has at his disposal it could be scary in terms of the the, the potential that justin fields has yeah i'm i'm with you on that because i i think if you watch those two guys play you say man physically justin gifted wise is there now it's about mm. sharpening the decision making and speeding it up just a little bit right like sharpen it a little bit speed it up a little bit and see where it takes you uh i i think we had a discussion in the media room sometime in december where, where we were talking about that ohio state phenomenon where, where you you do feel comfortable and you do feel protected and you can wait for things to come open and, and luke gets like hammers at home like don't don't wait on it if it's not there when you look at it Go to your next thing and get that five yard check down and let's let's just get to the next play on the script and we'll we'll, we'll roll from there. And so that's something that, that Justin has to do. But I think and I, and I said like you know um, you, you're you're throwing those plays in college against Rutgers and you said now now Justin's the quarterback of Rutgers. You know right, <laughs> right. exactly. <laughs> that that that's the different thing. And I think that you, listen to be to be fair and I've, I've, I I I believe in Justin, so I've I've, I've supported him you know, publicly in terms of what I think it can be, but I'm also fair about critiquing him too. And so yeah. as much as I say, you know, when we, when we critique him for, you know, the, the plays like the sack fumble when he had, I think it was Dante Pettis running open, yeah. like when you can chicken for those plays and I say, Hey, 
you know, he's not used to having that pocket. He's not used to guys running open. So his head is just not there. There's a cumulative effect. But I'm also on the other side of it when he has these dynamic plays where everybody's like, look at him go run for 60 something yards that touchdown. What he should have done was hit Donnell Mooney wide open for the first down in the middle of the field. That's that's what should have happened on that play. And so I know he, he you know, described how I was about to. And then Moon wasn't looking. Moon stopped looking because you were late. Like right, you know what right, I mean? right, So Moon right. was ready to get into a scramble drill. But if you were on time, that should have been a 13, 14 yard completion for a first down right over the middle, right in your face. Now, God blessed you. And so you took <laughs> off and ran 70 yards for a touchdown. That's phenomenal. Everybody's like, yeah, that's great. And I, and I me too. It was exciting. It's great. But when he gets to the point where that thing is second nature, where boom, there's 14 yards there, boom, there's 12 yards there, boom, there's nine yards there. That's when he's going to be truly, truly different because he's still going to have this dynamic athletic ability that's going to take over after that. Well, that, well that's it. And like, you know, the, 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 this argument gets exaggerated at a point where it's like, oh, everybody wants him to throw for 300 yards. And it's like, well, hold on a minute. No, no, we, we want him to throw for 200 yards, <laughs> right? Like we, we got to get past 200 yards on a regular basis. And the way you get past 200 yards on a regular basis, is what you just talked about is taking the six, taking the eight, taking the 12, taking the four yard check down that becomes 22 because your running back has, has made it into something. And now all of a sudden you've got six more completions on the ledger that have, have pushed your pass. 80 yards, on, right. Moved your <laughs> offense up, maybe turned a, a punt into a field goal, a field goal into a touchdown. And now all of a sudden you see what high level offense starts to do. So like, like I'm excited. And one of the reasons I'm excited about covering 2023 is because we're not going to get to the end of 2023. God willing that Justin stays healthy, knocking on wood over here. You're going to have 40 career starts under your belt at that point. Yeah. And there's not going to be as much gray area as there is now. Mm -hmm. And we're going to know, right. And, and we're going to know one way or the other, which way this is going, where it's headed, where the ceiling is, where the floor is, how much they've changed over a year. And so that's maybe in a year full of super exciting possibilities and storylines that might be for me the most exciting because this body of evidence and this sample size in 2023 is going to tell us a lot. Yeah, it's go time for Justin Fields. We we're talking about it being go time for Ryan Poles and him having that kind of, you know, honeymoon period where there wasn't much expectations. Same thing can be said for Justin Fields in terms of how last year went for him and then what the roster was this year. Next year, that you don't have that kind of defense, right? You should be surrounded by more talent. We'll see how this offseason goes. But it's go time for you, sir. It's time for you to go ahead and start putting some of these wins on your back and say, hey, we won because Justin Fields took us 85 yards in a minute and a half with one timeout and we got the game winning touchdown or whatever it may have been. You got to start to see some of those types of things from him. And so there aren't going to be any built in excuses for him going forward if they're able to get the talent around him, which I think they will. Those those excuses got to go. You're going to be able to say definitively, this is the guy or Unfortunately, we got to find another quarterback. I know you were right down the road from me in Atlanta in that in that beautiful press box at Mercedes-Benz Stadium when uh, Justin threw that game-ending uh, interception. And you remember yeah. the row above us, right? Yeah. Can you describe what we heard in the row above us when when that throw was made? <laughs> well, they were excited, but I think that everybody was just they 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 they, 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 they were disappointed, right? You had you have them behind us, and they're like, oh, because you want to believe that he's like the Paul's guy physically slammed oh, no. the table you know like you you felt like i felt like spray of his sprite or whatever come off the table you know like, <laughs> you 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 want to you want to believe he's the guy you got this excitement going on you're trying to go down there you think this is going to be the one he's gonna take us down there and get a win and then he throws that pass and it's just like mm, and it's like i looked up like oh <laughs> and I, I think i think i might have asked like jason lee's like yo can i say something about that he's like no nah, you probably shouldn't i was like all right cool <laughs> Right, right. It's it, and it's like it's like one of those worlds. It's you, you watch this down the tail end of the Mitch Trubisky era, where you'd sit in press boxes and you'd see in the reflection of the glass in front of you, you'd be able to yes. catch Ryan Pace's face, you yes. know, and there'd be a game that you're just getting thrashed at Lambeau and you'd look up and you'd be like, man, this is like a hard thing to look at because you just feel the soul of these guys getting ripped out at moments. And so anyway, it's a fascinating kind of look behind the curtain of, those, of what those, those moments games are. are different, man. I, I, I wish, I wish the fans could get that kind of peek behind the curtain because those role games were different. Like you said, the GM is sitting right there with the assistant GM. Those guys are sitting right behind us and it's like you can hear them you can feel them and to your point you can most often see them through the reflection of the glass and it's like <laughs> you can like you can see them react the same way you would react when you see something like oh and but they're trying to not give it up but they can't help it right and especially what what, what ryan pace and those guys were were dealing with in that last year but you see that same emotion coming out from ryan Posey, and you're absolutely right about that reaction in atlanta 
Yeah, it was it was nuts. So, all right, before we get out of here, you've got this opportunity now in 2023 to reshape your roster. And mm-hmm. we all know that I've said this for, for, for weeks now that in free agency in the draft, no matter what they do, they're going to be right because every single position on that roster needs some love and needs some help in there. But if you're in Ryan Poles' shoes right now and you've got an opportunity to take one position group and I just give you, I say, like, dump your resources at this and, and, and walk me into training camp in July at Hallis Hall and tell me which position group that you want to be as, as, as rock solid as humanly possible. What is it? It's tough, man. It's tough, man. It's tough because I got two. <laughs> I, <laughs> say, right? I've got like, six. So <laughs> part of, part of me wants to say, let's let's. If Justin Fields is the most important piece, right, then get him what he needs. Get him a serious offensive line in front of him. Find out if you can go get Brown from the Chiefs. Find out what you want to do in the draft. Who else you can bring in and sure up that offensive line. But man, I. Watching that defensive line all season, you have to overhaul that thing. You've got to get some people on there that are absolute game wreckers, absolute difference makers. And so by a hair and kind of reluctantly, I'll go with defensive line. Go get some people that can get after the quarterback. Go get some people that can stop the run, earn the right to rush the passer. We didn't see that. You had your rookie strong safety lead you in sacks. That's right. not good, right? That's not right. what you want. And so you've got to go get some guys, and I prefer to build it inside out. I know, you know, we talk about how important it is to have an edge rusher, but for me, the edge rusher should be or needs to be that final, final piece, right? I don't think it should be your first piece because I think if the edge rusher is the first piece, it becomes easier to kind of um, – mitigate what he's able to do right it comes easier to deal with them you can slap protection to him you can roll away from him, those types of things i like those game changing defensive tackles to start it if we already have those guys sure give me the edge rusher but i need difference makers in the middle can you go get some of those difference makers in the middle whether that's in free agency or it's in the draft get some difference makers in the middle then find some pieces on the edge but i would love to see that defensive line be overhauled because i love what they got on the back end right now that secondary is primed to be really really good and if you can pair them with a legitimate pass rush, I'd be excited to see what those young kids can do on the back end. So just by a smidgen, I would choose a uh, defensive line over offensive line if I had to choose one, but they need to get some help at both. The beauty of that question is there's not a wrong answer. That's the, the greatest <laughs> part about the whole thing. I just looked up the stats while you were talking. The Eagles had five players with more sacks than the, the, the Bears team leader. So that tells yeah. you, and the, your yeah. team leader was a rookie safety. And so you've got to, you've got to find s- some ways to disrupt things, both against the run and in the pass. I'm a, I'm a receiver guy at heart impulsively. I'm like, get me, get Cause I love the flash and I love the sizzle of the receiver, but I'm going the other, I'm going the other trench. I'm, I'm going the offensive line because I think if you can get a, a group of seven or eight and, and just really make that rock solid. Now all of a sudden you create that comfort and that calm that is needed for the quarterback to take that next step. And it's just going to be really fascinating to see where they go about it. You remember walking into training camp last July and they're like, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later, we'll know where, you know, where the offensive line is. And Oh, by the way, this is Riley. We just brought him in yesterday. Right, and oh, that's right. Michael guys introduce yourself to Michael in the cafeteria. You know, he, he's going to help out for a few weeks. And then we got to week 18 and we're like, how many different combinations of guys have we had and, and how many different position changes and injuries and flip flops? Like they've got to figure out a way to get a core. And then obviously you're going to have injuries and you need to have, backups sure. that can come in and stabilize it so I, I just go on the opposite side neither one of us is wrong but it's it's a really good uh debate and we wouldn't have been wrong if we went wide receiver either right <laughs> like i mean like like that, that that they have so many needs on this team but i think getting it right in the trenches has to be first so offense defense get those get the trenches right but the good thing is then they've got the resources they could answer multiple questions this offseason you could go get yourself a solid offensive line and a solid defensive line. You could give somebody some money to play defensive tackle, and then you could draft an offensive tackle, or vice versa. You could do it. it depends on how you see the draft, right? And what what questions can you answer in free agency that will dictate what you do in the draft? And so they can answer a lot of questions this year. And then because they have the number one pick, they should still be in pretty good position in terms of what they're able to do in the draft next year. So whatever answers they can't, whatever questions they can't answer this offseason, they should just be one or two players away come next year, right? So they answer as many questions as they can this year. Next year, they should go into the offseason and say, okay, all we need is X. All we need is whatever this thing may be. And so uh, they can answer multiple questions in this offseason and they have the resource to do it and they and they need to. 
It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I always say on the beat, one of my favorite weeks is like, it's like May 3rd, May 4th, when, when, when everything's in the rear view, your lot, your roster is by and large set. You're getting ready for rookie mini camp and OTAs and, and all of the rumor chasing and speculation is, is behind you. And you're like, this is it. This is, this is the, the, the puzzle they put together. Now let's look at this instead of looking at all these possibilities, some of them pie in the sky, some of them unrealistic, some of them right down the middle. So like start my countdown. You can start my countdown clock. It's probably like 90 some days to, to, to May 3rd and, and we'll, we'll figure out a way to get there. I'm hundred percent with you on that day. Like all, all of this pre-draft and pre, you know, <laughs> uh, free agency that, that it's fine. Right. And it's, it's, it's something that we do and it's going to be done. But at the end of the day, it ain't our job, right? Ryan Poles and his staff are going to do what they're going to do. And then after they've done that, we'll get to sit back and look and say, okay, this is what it is. Let's evaluate them. Let's give our projections. And then let's go see how these things turn out. That's when it's going to be exciting for me. We can talk about, you know, are they going to go Will Anderson? Are they going to go Jalen Carter? Are they going to get this tackle in free agency? This de- like. I don't know what they're going to do, right? Maybe they'll get Devontae Adams, and I've heard about Khalil Mack wanting to come back to this. Like, it's, there's all this stuff going on. We'll, I have no idea, right? <laughs> um, we'll see. And come early May, we'll know, and then it'll be time to say, okay, all right, Ryan Poles, this is what you went with. It better be a home run. There you go. There you go. No dribblers back to the mound. We've, we've no given up on those. No dribblers back to the mound. We're not accepted. We're going to boo from the crowd if we get a dribbler back to the mound. Look, hopefully uh, we can get you back in here and we can discuss the players that they do acquire and we can figure out if uh, if they, they they followed your path or followed my path or followed any one of the, the 3,000 other paths that are out there for them. But this is a, a great discussion. I appreciate you jumping on today, Herb. Man, anytime, man. Thanks so much for having me. Absolute pleasure to hang out and talk bears with you for a while. We will have uh, more Super Bowl coverage next week uh, when the Take the North podcast returns before Chiefs and Eagles are played. Remember to, uh, again, download, like, and subscribe. Thanks for joining us. As always, it's been a fantastic discussion. For Herb Howard, I'm Dan Weeder. We'll talk to you next time.